Now we are not broadcast, so I will go with it, and then uh, all people will, all attendees will hear. Okay, so one minute. Oh, you have a great place there. What What is it after you? Oh, it's um, it's my favorite room in the whole world. It's my library. Wow. Oh, wow, that sounds good. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so. One minute more, yeah. Okay. I'm... Let's... Okay, I'm starting. Dobry, witamy Państwa wszystkich serdecznie w to środowe popołudnie. Bartosz Sokoliński z Agencji Rozwoju Przemysłu i Paweł Pacek. Paweł, tak, powitajmy wszystkich. Szanowni Państwo, dzisiaj kolejne spotkanie, to już piąte. Kolejny fantastyczny gość z nami, a tak naprawdę kilku gości, bo mamy również prowadzącego fantastycznego z SGK. Paul Misnener z Amazona będzie za chwilę opowiadał o tym, jak powstał Amazon, jak Amazon rozwija innowacje. Nie możemy się już doczekać tej prezentacji. My chyba na tyle. Powiemy może jeszcze, Pawle, kto będzie w sobotę? E, oczywiście, chociaż planowałem to powiedzieć na sam koniec, e, już po, powiem, po webinarze, żeby, żeby zostało na dłużej, ale e, oczywiście nie się utrwala, jest to Sramana Mitra, niezwykła, charyzmatyczna e, twórczyni e, wirtualnego akceleratora One Million by One Million. Niesamowite spo, spotkanie przed nami e, już w sobotę e, następne, ale nie, przesądza, znaczy nie, nie, nie opowiadajmy o tym, co... Za, um, za parę dni, skoro um, tak ważne spotkanie jak z Polem i Sederem przed nami. Okay, so let's switch into English and Rafał, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Ah, one, thank sorry, you, one, more, one more thing. We have Claudia with us. Claudia Tolman, it's uh, a gift uh, to us from her, she will be draw everything and recording on paper, uh, everything, uh, what uh, yeah, Paul will say. Yeah, 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 I will <laughs> record. 
I will make a graphic recording digital or even remote digital graphic recording of, of the meeting. Bravo. Uh, yeah, it, it uh, won't be very easy because Paul uh, doesn't have a presentation. So we'll see. <laughs> Let's start. Thank you, Rafa. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for introducing me. Uh, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. It's, uh, it's, my, it's my pleasure to be here as a, and, and make the introduction to this webinar. My name is Rafał Kutliński, and I'm a managing director of Amazon Development Center in Poland, which is based in Gdańsk. Um, this development center and overall Amazon presence in Poland has started from the, from the Amazon investment in the Polish startup called Ivona Software. And I was part of this company when, when it all has happened. Uh, that was um, this um, investment and the, the idea of investing in the, in the startup came from the fact that the startup itself was known for its innovative and high quality text to speech synthesis. Um, and the reason for the investment was a big innovative idea to build a voice controlled computer. And the project, the whole idea from about this computer, about, the, about this project has started as almost every project at Amazon from building a document called a press release. This document and the whole point of the document was to describe and focus on the customer and describe the problem, customer problem that we are going to solve. And this project, this document that has been built, uh, in, in this project that has been initiated that way resulted in building a ton of in, in, innovation in order to, to actually solve this customer problem. So solve the problem of building the computer which can be um, accessed and can be controlled by, via voice. And this is right now today known as Amazon Alexa. That's how Amazon Alexa got funded, got created. Today, Amazon in Poland um, is one of the biggest investors. Um, Amazon has invested over, over 3 billion in Poland, including customer fulfillment, infrastructure, uh, research facilities like the one in Dansk, and so on and so forth. Uh, we have offices in Warsaw and around AWS and corporate uh, there's a technology development center and research center in Gdańsk working with AWS, Alex, and Ring. Some um, other technology advanced um, centers like fulfillment centers like in, around Poland, uh, in total employing over 16,000 people. So it's a, it's a huge company in Poland right now. And we keep growing. Amazon and AWS are constantly looking among others for software development engineers, machine learning scientists, DevOps, language specialists, business uh, generalists, project managers, and so on and so forth, uh, to build new innovative projects for our customers. So actually, Amazon in Poland has started from innovation, which was driven by customer obsession. And we keep building new innovative products for our customers, because as, as Jeff mentioned, and, and I know this quote is there in the description of the, of the webinar, being customer focused allow, allows us to be more pioneering, more innovative. So today it's my privilege and pleasure to introduce uh, today's webinar, as this is exactly a talk about customer obsession and how it drives innovation at Amazon. And it's my pleasure to introduce the host of this webinar, Paul Misener. Uh, I believe he's uh, the best person at Amazon to talk about Amazon culture of innovation and customer obsession, because Paul has been with Amazon for over 20 years and at Amazon, for many years is an Amazon Vice President for Global Innovation. It's a great pleasure. Paul, the floor is yours. Rafael, thank you so much. It's great to see you again. I spent some time with you in Dansk uh, a couple of years ago. We had a, a great uh, deal of fun together. And thank you all for participating. I hope everyone is well and staying safe. Um, this is a, a trying time for all of us. but. I frequently talk about innovation, particularly innovation at Amazon. And one of the things that I often mention is a mistake that a lot of enterprises make. I mean, large companies, small companies, government institutions. The mistake they make is that when they are being successful, they have a good product, they have a good service, their customers are happy. They don't want to innovate because why do they? Why would they? Uh, but it's a big mistake because oftentimes uh, an enterprise, a company, or again, a government agency, can be um, very successful with the product or service that they've been offering for years, maybe even decades. But then something happens. Maybe the, uh, the patent expires or a new competitor emerges or there's a new government regulation or a trade war or 
some unforeseen externality that changes everything. Well, we're in the midst of that right now. And so it's, uh, I have some bad news for you and some good news for you. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic um, has forced all of us to be innovative in a way that some of us would not want to be. Uh, but those of us who are eager to innovate at all times welcome the opportunity to innovate on behalf of customers and frankly, in this time, uh, on behalf of humanity. But even those of us who may not want to be innovative at this point in their, their enterprises, their organizations, history, um, they now must be innovative. And so that's the bad news. The good news is everyone is in this circumstance together. Uh, all around the world, it's hard to imagine a pocket of the world that won't be affected by the current pandemic. And so we're all needing to try new things in a way that just months ago we didn't need to try and now, now we do. So the, the real challenge then is to figure out what's the method by which we're going to innovate? Well, how are we gonna go about doing it? Um, Amazon has been innovating much the same way uh, for the past over, well, over 20 years since I've been with the company. Uh, obviously the, the company has changed in that time in both scope and scale but the way we do things really hasn't changed. It's remained fundamentally the same, including with respect to innovation. We have, we have methods uh, that we use to, to innovate. Now, two things that are important to say right up front. First of all, um, we're not claiming this is the, uh, the only way. We're not even claiming it's the best way to innovate. It just happens to be the way Amazon does it. And so please don't take this to mean that we think that no one else can be innovative. That's not true. There's lots of innovation going around All around, I, I'd just like to be able to share with you how Amazon thinks about it and goes about it. Um, and, um, and secondly, you're certainly welcome to try any of these techniques yourselves. I mean, there's there's no uh, secret here. I'm sharing it all with you, and um, we've uh, we've managed to do okay with our customers over the years uh, using these techniques. And, and maybe you could find some uh, success using the same techniques. Um, so, first of all, this this coronavirus. Um, pandemic has forced us to innovate in ways that we didn't expect. Uh, and, you know, fr frankly, this has touched all aspects of our company and our customers. We recognize that. And it's, it's humbling uh, and it's greatly satisfying to be in a position to be able to help out so many people all at once. And so we're, we're heads down focused on helping our customers best as we can, any way we can, uh, as well as our employees. And so there's two areas of innovation that I want to just mention briefly. One is with respect to employee safety, which we take as our top priority. We really are very serious about this. And in the first half of this year, we will spend somewhere on the order of $800 million uh, on safety measures uh, for, for our employees. Um, in addition, we've already introduced over 150 different process changes, which changes the, change the way we do things, how we interact among ourselves for, to promote, for example, social distancing, uh, as well as uh, sanitation. And so those, those kinds of innovations we're, we're being forced to do uh, and we're happy to do on behalf of our employees. That's not something we expected. The other side of things is, is our supply chain. Um, you know, we, we engage in a lot of predictive analytics trying to predict what customers will be buying and when. And so we not only fi uh, you know, follow the seasonality of, of retail, but also uh, fashion trends, uh, new you know, new, uh, new lines of products that uh, our customers would want, those sorts of things. And so we're, we're always focused on that. And suddenly we have this externality that nobody saw coming and we've had to react to it. And so what we've done is we've, uh, we've shifted our priorities to focus on household essentials and medical supplies, for example. And those will all get priority in uh, storage in our facilities as well as in shipping. Uh, so just to, just. I, I don't know if it makes you feel better, but the, the fact of the matter is we're, we're being forced to innovate in ways that we didn't anticipate either. And so the fact that we're all having to do this simultaneously, I think is a little comforting. And, um, and frankly, there, there's room for innovation now that is not just cool technology, it's not just serving your customers, but it's also helping out humanity. Uh, we, as a, we as a species are all in this together, and uh, I hope to see you all on the other side of it. Um, as far as Amazon's methods of operations and uh, innovation go, uh, we're guided by something we call our leadership principles. And these are 14 tenets of operation. They're all on, our, they're on every one of our websites around the world, so you can check them out if you'd like. Um, but there are a couple that are particularly important for uh, innovation at Amazon. These, these principles, by the way, we call them leadership principles. 
but they apply to the entire company. All 800,000, 900,000 of us uh, are expected to uphold these principles in our in our day-to-day -day operations and how we hire people, how we evaluate ourselves. Um, but one in particular uh, is sort of the, the first among equals. It is the, is the most important of all these principles, and that's customer obsession. Um, Rafael just a, a minute ago talked about the writing a press release and working backwards from that. I'll just add a little bit to that. And that is to say, when we write out a press release that is designed to go out years from now, uh, and then we have to figure out how to do what we announce in that press release, we're doing a couple of things, one of which is particularly important. By writing a press release, we're writing it in customer terms, customer language. What's in it for her? So it's much more the what of innovation as opposed to the how of innovation. So we want to describe what it is that uh, is in it for the customer. And then, um, then we are essentially admitting, because we're planning to send this press release out months or years from now, we're admitting that what we want to do is impossible today. Because if it were possible today, we'd send out the press release next week and then you know, it would all be over. But we're recognizing that what we want to do for customers is simply not possible yet. The other leadership principle that's particularly important is, is a little bit hard to, to hear or to, to say, uh, but it's our right a lot, our right a lot. And it, it not only just means that you want to be smart about things and you want to be correct, but it also, it, it doesn't say our right all the time. It says our right a lot. And that means you can be wrong a lot, at least when you're experimenting on behalf of customers. Here's how this works. If you want to do something new, something truly innovative, something hasn't been done before, you must experiment. Because if, if you don't know how it's going to turn out, you have to find out by experimenting with it. If you already know the outcome of an experiment, it's not really an experiment at all. And so at Amazon, we're constantly experimenting, constantly trying things. And guess what? Lots of those experiments fail. A whole lot of experiments fail. In fact, Jeff takes uh, personal credit for billions of dollars worth of failure. I'm sure he's right. But he's also told us that as, as time goes on, our failures will get bigger and bigger. And so we fully embrace the notion of being willing and able to fail. The reason why this is sustainable, though, in a business is because just a few wins will pay for lots and lots of losses. Um, the, the way Jeff likes to talk about it is if, with respect to sport. If, um, if a professional football club is playing a bunch of young boys, uh, who's going to win the match? Well, the professional football club will always win the match, and it might be something like 75 to nil. But how, how, what does the professional football club get out of that? They get one win, just one win. That's it. No matter how much better they were than the other team, they only get one win. Business does not work that way. A business success doesn't necessarily to just get you one win, it can get you 10 wins, 100 wins, 10,000 wins. There's no upper cap on success. And as a result, just a few big successes can pay for a whole lot of failed experiments along the way. And so our, our embrace of failure in the context of innovation is, is fundamental to how we go about designing and dreaming up new products and services for our customers. Uh, over the years, we've had a couple failures that have, that have popped out and uh, customers have experienced them. Uh, one, when I joined the company, we were experimenting with a, um, a way to allow third parties to use our website to make sales. And we had an auction site, we had a site called Z Shops, and they just, they weren't very good. And customers didn't like them. So we had these two public failures, but we followed it on with what we call Amazon Marketplace now. And that's where buyer customers can go on to our websites and purchase things from third parties, not Amazon, but third parties. Uh, in addition to being able to purchase things from Amazon. And it turns out that well over half the items sold through Amazon are not sold by Amazon. They're sold by somebody else. So this has been a huge success over the years, uh, both for the seller customers and for the buyer customers. Um, but it started out with these two failures. And so we, we're, we're willing to experiment with things and fail uh, and then move on. Now, um, we, like the, we, want, we want the failures at Amazon to be uh, inside, in-house, and we don't want them to get out to customers, uh, not because we're embarrassed about them. I'm here, I'm telling you about them. So I, we're happy to talk about our many failures and how much they've cost, um, but we don't want our customers to be uh, experimented on. We want to experiment on their behalf, but we don't want them to uh, bear the brunt of a failure. And so there have only been a few over the years that I really feel like uh, were, were bad for customers in the first instance, and we, we, we don't like that. 
And so part of that, that leadership principle, our right a lot, talks about how at Amazon, individuals, especially leaders, are expected to disconfirm their beliefs. They work to disconfirm their beliefs. Um, this is a matter of overcoming the very human confirmation bias that exists in all of us. Um, when confirmation bias means when we have an idea, we look around us and we see all sorts of confirming data. Oh, that, oh, that supports my great idea. And then you, you hear anecdotes. Oh, wow, that's, that supports my idea. People do this. I'm not sure why evolutionarily we do that, but we do. Uh, so overcoming confirmation bias is something we actively uh, attempt. We, we fight against confirmation bias. And so we try, to, we try to make our own ideas fail. And so if you have a great idea for a new product or service that you want to offer to customers at some point, um, you want to try to make it fail. You want to try to break it. And you want to enlist your teammates to help break your idea. Uh, and this is a, a, an interesting uh, reason why diversity is so important at Amazon. Not only is it the right thing to do, not only does diversity expand the available talent pool, but diversity allows people to disconfirm their beliefs easier than if it were not a diverse environment. So if, if you surround yourself with people who went to your same school, they all look like you, they talk like you, they think like you, you're not gonna be able to very easily disconfirm your beliefs because they'll share the belief. But if you have a diverse set of um, coworkers, the coworkers who have different viewpoints, different experiences, different ideas, they'll be able to look at it and try to make it fail faster you, so, that, so that it fails internally before getting out to customers. So that's our right a lot. Um, there's, there's, there are two others that I think are important. One is called invent and simplify. And the, the, the whole idea is this, we want everyone on Amazon to be an inventor, to be innovative. There's not just one set of really smart people that live in some place like, like dance uh, and uh, do all the innovation for Amazon. They do great innovations there for sure. But everyone in the whole company is expected to do some form of innovation. Now, even those who work in the warehouse who practice what are called Kaizans, and uh, um, I, I'm, I'm confident that the pro Professor Morocco knows about these, but what it is is a technique developed by uh, Toyota in the 1980s uh, that encourages small incremental improvements for everything around you. So if you can just make a very small change that is repeated over and over, you know, over days, weeks, months, years, um, then that small little change grows, um, and as, especially as a company scales, it grows exponentially. Uh, another form of Kaizen is to look for things that have already been done, techniques, um, tools that have already been used in another circumstance, and they're applied in your current circumstance. And so that's being inventive, that's simplifying things. But of course, we also have innovators uh, like the team at Dansk. They, these, these are very smart, big brain people who are working on very, very tough problems. I mean, uh, uh, you know, voice recognition and actual natural language recognition is really, really hard. Um, and so these teams uh, and, and elsewhere around the world are, are trying to, uh, to uh, solve this difficult challenge on behalf of customers. The, the other last leadership principle I'll mention here is, is easily the most prosaic, and it's called deliver results. And the concept is this. The, we're not an academic institution. We, we are not, uh, you know, innovating just for the sake of innovation and to be proud of ourselves and that sort of thing. We actually are delivering products and services that require operational excellence. And so to ultimately get our products and services out to customers, that in itself takes work and we have to do it. It's, it's kind of the, the final step in innovation, but if we don't actually deliver results to customers, they're not going to see any of the benefits of, of us being so uh, innovative. So th these are the fundamental ways in which we do things at Amazon. I think the, uh, the press release writing exercise is, um, is an important one, but there are other management tools that we use that you might want to try yourselves. Uh, first of all, the bullet point are, you know, bullet point presentations are not used at Amazon to, uh, to make decisions. If we have a decision to make, we require the proponent of the decision to write out a text narrative describing uh, all the ideas that went into it, the pros and cons of doing it, all the thinking that went into the idea. And then we call together the decision makers to read this narrative in the meeting and then make a decision. And it turns out that although it's, it's harder to write a textual narrative than it is to write bullet points, it actually forces you to think through ideas in a way that you might not uh, have done otherwise. And then it makes the decision-making part uh, very efficient because the decision-makers are not going to spend a whole lot of time trying to understand a 50-page you know, uh, bullet point deck. 
all they have to do is spend half an hour reading a, uh, a document, a narrative, which uh, you know has sentences and, and paragraphs and sections and such. And so the whole thing uh, goes very efficiently when it comes to making a decision. Another important thing that we do at Amazon, which I, I think a lot of uh, older enterprises sometimes fall down on, is our, our very deliberate uh, uh, methodical way of determining what kind of decision we're going to be making. We simply we divide the decision uh, is into two groups. Uh, group one is what we call one-way doors. These are decisions, if you make them, it's really hard, if not impossible, to unmake them. So that's um, those kinds of decisions, you want to have all the available information. Uh, you want to spend a lot of time analyzing, assessing, uh, you know, running narrative, uh, uh, hypothetical narratives and that sort of thing. Uh, before you make the decision, because once you've made it and taken it, it's going to be very hard to undo it. But it turns out that the vast majority of decisions in an enterprise of the scale of an Amazon, uh, or even just a, you know, a, a mid-sized company, are not one-way doors. They're two-way doors. And so what that means is that if you take the decision and it turns out not to be a good decision, you can untake it. You can stop doing whatever you decided to do. And those kinds of decisions uh, should be made quickly. The, the trap that older enterprises tend to fall in is to treat every single kind of decision they have to make as a one-way door, when it's not. Um, but here's the thing. If, you, if people are afraid of failure, they're going to treat everything as a one-way door because they don't want to be embarrassed by having to reverse the decision by coming back in the, the two-way door. It's, but what that does is it really slows everything down. So if you want to operate at speed, make sure that the two-way door decisions are made quickly. Um, and uh, because, of course, if you... If uh, it turns out to be wrong, then you can, uh, you can undo it. Now, I mentioned before that the reason why this kind of an approach to things is sustainable is because there are a lot of, uh, there are so many opportunities. If, if you're always innovating and innovating in parallel, uh, a lot of uh, failures will be paid for by just a, a few big successes. Um, one of those successes at Amazon was uh, something called Amazon Web Services, of all things, right? This is a, a cloud computing business arm of Amazon. Um, but it was, it was invented in the, uh, the mid-2000s um, as a way to solve some internal challenges that we had. And we also were seeing other enterprise uh, partners that we were working with having some of the same challenges. And so we developed a, a set of tools internally and then made those tools available externally. And now Amazon... Uh, the, the parent organization and all the other uh, operating organizations use AWS as the, the, as the toolkit. And so, um, it, you know, we're a big, we Amazon are a big customer of AWS. And it's a great relationship because when we have a problem, we tell AWS, AWS fixes it or invents something new and then makes it available to everybody, not just to us. I mean, it's, it's, it's available to all of our our cloud computing customers. And that's an example of something that, that uh, succeeded in, in a way that has paid for a lot of um, uh, a lot of failures along the way. So um, I, I'm really, you know, I'm happy to take questions at this point, if that makes sense, or I can, I can continue going. But uh, Professor, what do you think? Should we uh, move to questions? Yes, I, I, th I, think, I think we can because we have a lot of uh, questions. Uh, so we can start uh, now uh, with, with them. Uh, maybe we'll start with the first question, which was asked, uh, which was uh, asked uh, before the uh, meeting. Uh, but I think it's uh, really interesting. Uh, how do you collect innovative ideas among uh, your employees? Uh, how do you ensure that uh, employees, uh, even at the lower level, come uh, forward with new ideas? And more importantly, do you have a process to make sure that those ideas are not being lost somewhere in the different levels of the company hierarchy? Yeah, no, it's a good question. It's a real challenge too, especially at a company that now has 900,000 employees. I mean, it's just it, it, this sort of a scale, it, it, it's a particular challenge, but we have, we have worked very hard to maintain a business that is full of little startups all throughout the company. And so there's, there's a couple of uh, process arrangements that we have inside the company to maintain the startup mentality and the startup approach to challenges and opportunities. We have a, a mechanism called the two pizza team and that is where when we ever face a new challenge or a new opportunity, we assign a small group of people to address that challenge or opportunity. And um, that, they can be drawn from different organizations. In fact, it's better if they are drawn from different organizations. And 
the, uh, the reason it's called a two pizza team is because the number of people brought together in one of these groups should be comfortably fed with two extra large pizzas. And so it's not three or four pizza people, that's, that's too much pizza, but it's not 12 or 13 people, that's not enough pizza. So it's somewhere in between there. We just wanted not to have a, you know, sort of a bureaucratic set number. Uh, sometimes it might make sense to have nine people, other times it might make sense to have seven people. It just, it depends on the particular needs of this, of these groups. And so what happens is, so a challenge or opportunity some, we're made aware of, and it could be by a very junior person, as you mentioned. If, if they bring this to their manager and the manager says, oh gosh, we should look into this, then the two pizza team will be assembled to address the challenge or opportunity. And it may work for two weeks. You know, it may, they may come up with a very simple, elegant solution and they all go home and that's it. And then it gets assigned to somebody to implement. Uh, or it may turn out to be uh, uh, not a fruitful or a, you know, a prospect or idea after a few weeks. And then you say, ah, we're, we don't want to do this. That, that doesn't really make sense. We, in other words, we've managed to disconfirm our beliefs. Um, other times, it, it, these teams last for longer and they really build up a new kind of a business, perhaps, or a new product they're focusing on. And then it's handed off to operationalize once upper level management has made a decision. So we keep trying to keep track of all this. Now, at some level, we have to prioritize. Like any organization, we have limited resources. And oftentimes, the, the resources at Amazon that are most limited are software development engineers. Um, if, if you've got a circumstance where a very talented um, machine learning expert has been on a project for a couple of years and she's done with the project now, she's uh, had a success supporting this new project and uh, now she's ready for her next assignment. Uh, you know she's talented, uh, she's energetic, she's available. The choice of what next thing you assign her to is a very big decision. It's very big because if you get it right, then you've assigned a real talented individual to help out a team and she's gonna do great and it's gonna be great for customers. If you do it wrong, then you've wasted her time, her talents on something that was not, not worthy of her. And so um, it, it's that kind of a resource decision is limiting because she can't be, you know, she can't be assigned to two assignments or you know, two projects at once. And so as a result, that kind of a choice is a hard one to make. And you know, uh, it's, it's a little bit, it's a little bit qualitative. Uh, it's hard to always measure those things quantitatively. Okay, maybe a little bit uh, connecting. Uh, how, uh, how long uh, on average does it take to make an innovation, uh, innovative decision uh, at Amazon? Oh gosh, I, I have no idea. I mean, it, it, so it's, it varies so much depending on what kind of project it is. If uh, if there's a new feature or tool being developed by, uh, in, for AWS or by AWS for AWS customers, that could move very quickly. That could be a month and a half or a few weeks to do something innovative that they, they address as a problem. See, unlike other kinds of customers, like consumer customers, the AWS customers tend to be fairly sophisticated developers. And so we get a lot of our ideas for new innovations in AWS um, from our customers. They say, hey, I've got this problem. I don't know what to do about it. Can you guys help? And so a team of engineers might sit down and fix it in a week or two and have a new feature available that they'll make available to everybody. Um, that's a fast one. Uh, a much longer term project like the Kindle, that took years to develop uh, because we were starting from scratch. And recall that no one was clamoring for an electronic book. No one was saying, you know, the, the physical book has had a good run, but now we want to we should be moving to electronic books. No one was asking us to do this, and we just thought it was a good idea for a lot of reasons. A lot of customers would love it, and it'd be you know nice to be able to haul around thousands of books in your in your back pocket. Um, and and yet that took a long time to develop because to get into the hardware business and the electronic ink devices, those, that's that's hard business. So that just takes longer. So I'm sorry it's not a better uh, answer, but it's just I, I don't know how you would even uh, calculate it. Okay. Uh... Next question, uh, how are you looking for innovative solutions, only internally or externally as well? Yeah, it's, it's not one or the other, but for the most part, we tend to do things internally. Um, and it, it's not because we don't believe this great innovation going on externally, there is. And there have been some times when we've acquired uh, either companies or intellectual property or just the, the fact of customer obsession in an, an outside company, we'll, we'll find that very attractive. Uh, for example, Zappos, uh, when, uh, when Zappos was acquired, I guess it was 2009, um, it was just, you know, Jeff saw what Tony Shea was doing uh, in Zappos and just loved the, the customer obsession. And so Tony still runs that business um, after all these years. And so um, 
we're willing to be very humble about things and say, look, you know, we don't know everything. Uh, but at the same time, we'd like to think that we can develop things in, inside and, and focus on them. And so um, uh, even in this, this COVID-19 crisis, we're seeing opportunities that we may be able to help with some things. But it's, it's look, it's a humble thing. Um, and the reason I say it that way is just because we're good at a couple of things already doesn't mean that we're always going to be good at everything. I just, that just is not true. And, and we don't have that kind of hubris to suggest that. Um, rather, we have a history of developing an expertise in something and then taking the step of making that expertise available as a service. So we've done this many times over the years. Uh, Marketplace is an example. We developed a, a, a way to conduct transactions through a website, and then we made that available as a service to third-party sellers. AWS is an example. We figured out some, uh, you know, how to solve some challenges with our internal uh, compute capacity and, um, and, uh, and functionality, and we made that available as a service. So fulfillment, we first made it available only to our retail business and then to third parties, and so on. It's a long list of things. And so uh, I think sometimes people think that we go out and just develop things for third parties, uh, but in fact, if it's looked at closely, um, many of these major developments for third parties began as a development of an expertise for in-house. Okay, thank you. Uh how are you developing entrepreneurial innovators DNA uh, or skills among employees who are performing routine uh, tasks uh, on the lowest uh, ranking uh, position? Yeah. In the warehouses, for example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, it, it's, first of all, it's, a, it's an expectation in the company that people be innovative and inventive uh, at all levels of the company. And so when I mentioned these leadership principles uh, by which we operate, well, we also interview candidates based on these leadership principles. And so we were actually evaluating candidates who are applying for jobs at Amazon, not only on their skills and on their, their personalities that, you know, are they a good cultural fit, but specifically how have they abided by or lived, up, lived by uh, principles similar to our own leadership principles. And so we evaluate them, but they also have the opportunity to evaluate us. And so there is, uh, not only are we selecting employees for employment, but they're selecting an employer. And so by the time they go through the interview process, it's got to be crystal clear to them that they're expected to be innovative. The other aspect of this is not only this kind of expectation, but it's also permission. Uh, it's very liberating to have your CEO say, you know what, if you guys are experimenting and you're trying to innovate, it's okay if you fail. In fact, at some level, I expect you to fail because you can't be trying really hard if you're always succeeding. And so to have the boss say that, that's a, that's a very liberating piece of operating at Amazon. And so, sure, somebody on the warehouse floor practicing a Kaizen can say, you know, I think we can shave off a second in how fast this box moves across uh, the, the warehouse. You know, how, how, how fast can we get it from here to the truck to take it away? Um, you take off a second all the time and you apply it against billions of packages a year, that's a big deal. Maybe a little bit uh, similar question or uh, close to that. Uh, could you tell us more about Amazon's approach to people development, reskilling and upskilling uh, your employees? Yeah, um, it's, uh, it's very important to us to uh, maintain the culture, as I've mentioned, of the company, but it's also important that people be able to grow into that, into that culture. You know, there's, there's no way, uh, well, I suppose there is a way, but it's, it seems highly unlikely that any individual is equally adept at all 14 of the leadership principles. That just, you know, it, it seems extremely unlikely. Uh, and I don't even know how you would come up with that kind of measurement. But in any case, uh, there are always going to be areas uh, in which a person can improve. And so annually, I get evaluated uh, on my performance, and I'm told look, uh, in these areas, you're doing great for customers, and this is, we're happy with this. And in these areas, we'd like you to see you uh, spend more time, get better at that. And so it's, it is, it's, it's pretty surgical in the sense that uh, we're not sort of vaguely saying, hey, good job, or, you know, bad job. It's more like, here's what you're doing good, and along the lines of the leadership principles, and here's where you're not. Uh, we also offer training uh, throughout the company. It's, it's an important piece because you can't really just tell a person, you know, be better at this without guiding him or her. Um, and it's, it's also the case that we allow uh, employees, especially as the, uh, the, the company has grown, um, mobility within the company. So if you've been working in one area and you're, you know, you'd like to try something else, we're very open to that. I mean, there, there are very few times when that kind of thing is discouraged. And that usually is just for some specific, um, you know, uh, 
I don't know, a circumstance, like we're, we're coming to the end of a project and everybody's working weekends and nights to get this thing done, and it'll be done in two weeks, then let's talk about you know, going somewhere else. Uh, and so I think all those ways we, we offer development, for our, for our warehouse employees, we have, we have education systems that actually allow them to learn skills that aren't even of use at Amazon. Uh, and so what, what, we, what we do is we figure out what skills are in most high demand uh, including outside of Amazon, such as nursing, for example. We don't have a large you know, a nursing force, uh, and, and yet there are people who are interested in becoming nurses, and so we, we offer training in these areas uh, to employees who are interested. And the whole idea is we recognize that not everybody is going to make a career out of Amazon. If you come in and you're, you're working in the warehouse or you're, you're a software engineer, you, know, you may not stay for your entire career. I'm, I'm sort of a, you know, an old guy, and this is kind of what we did in our generation, but maybe not so anymore. So recognizing this, we just want to equip our, our employees with skills that are not only valuable at Amazon, but also could be valuable elsewhere in the community. Okay, a special question from the professor from my university. Uh, pandemic time is very difficult for all companies, especially for small and medium-sized enterprises. There is a lot of uh, talk uh, now about sustainability. How Amazon helps its suppliers survive this difficult situation. Uh, and uh, one more uh, question, what trends in terms of cost customers uh, will be leading uh, in the future? It's maybe the first uh, one uh, better. About sustainability. Yeah. So we recognize that we're part of, uh, of society. In fact, if anything has made crystal clear is we can be a very important part of society, making sure that essential services and goods are delivered to people in need. These can be consumer customers, they can be uh, medical facilities and that sort of thing. And so uh, it's both, you know, gratifying, but it's also a big responsibility to recognize how important it is to keep the, the, the community going. And that includes also the ecosystem that, that serves this community. It's not just Amazon operating independently, of course. We rely on suppliers, drivers, shippers, third-party sellers, uh, developers on the outside. I mean, there are all sorts of partners in our overall ecosystem. And so for the ones hardest hit by the pandemic, um, I think we've already made $25 million available to them just flat out. Um, and that, that's just for the, you know, the ones that are, are most needy. But also, we are providing services, we think, that are going to help people weather the pandemic and also be able to succeed afterwards. We, you know, we recognize that none of this is, uh, uh, is just going to you know, turn off. And so we've, we've got programs underway. And I know, you know Jeff is uh, personally funding a lot of things as well. Um, but... The partner ecosystem at Amazon has always been important. We've never viewed ourselves as sort of an island. And I mentioned a few minutes ago how we've taken, uh, on many occasions, I can probably list a dozen of them, where we've taken an internal skill that we developed for a core business that existed at the time and then made it available for other people to, to grow on. And, and one of the ways we look at this is that, you know, you can, you can do great things yourself, but one of the most... Um, satisfying accomplishments is to do something that allows others to be creative and others to have great ideas and to succeed. And so, you know, we, we could have chosen to develop a, you know, a computation uh, technologies and storage and uh, database management systems and just kept it to ourselves. But we thought it'd be much more interesting to make it available to third parties, including those who are, are direct competitors in other lines of business. This, in fact, this happens all the time where we will be supplying kind of goods and services to people who are competing with us, trying to take our business away. Um, but that's okay. Uh, it's, a, it's a great time to be a consumer right now because of that kind of um, tough competition that exists today. Uh, there's a lot of questions about uh, the future of uh, retail. Mm. Some uh, ideas uh, connected with that after COVID, of course. Yeah. So, um, there's a tremendous amount of opportunity for, for retail, and there has been for a long time, certainly pre-coronavirus, um, uh, but it turns out that the opportunity still is huge. So when I joined Amazon late 99, early 2000, um, you know, the predictions for 20-year growth of the internet were saying that you know, online retail would be like 60, 75% of retail. Well, it's still less than 10 worldwide. It's probably around five or six worldwide, and even in the most um, sort of e-commerce forward uh, countries like the U.S. or uh, the U.K. or Germany, some of these countries, it's still just like 12%. And so even in the most sort of e-commerce forward uh, uh, leading countries, 
uh, well over 80% of retail of commerce is still offline. So there's a tremendous amount of headroom for growth, not just by existing companies, by, by new ideas. And so, um, again, it's a, it's a good time for being a consumer. Um, and now seeing how important it is for, um, for consumers to be able to obtain things at, in their homes or businesses when they reopen to obtain them directly to the business, um, th there may be a, a faster shift, but still, there's a, there's a long way to go. Uh, there's a question about uh, um, startup, internal startups uh, at uh, Amazon. Can you share an example of employees uh, initiative, employee initiative that became an uh, internal startup and uh, now is running and scaling uh, business uh, um, this uh, last last years or may, maybe in the future? Um, I, I'm not sure I understand the question. I mean, are you talking about so Amazon uh, employees? Uh, about uh, uh, about internal startups uh, and uh, and uh, some examples of uh, successful case study of such a uh, startup initiated uh, inside the uh, company maybe uh, invested by by uh, Amazon. Oh, I, I see. Okay, so as we were just discussing, we're a part of an ecosystem. We're uh, we're one of many players, uh, and and obviously we're one of the larger ones. Uh, in the ecosystem, but that doesn't mean this, that we are immune to startups. In fact, quite the opposite. We we encourage startups uh, through a lot of the, the products and services we offer. In fact, one that I encourage everybody on this this webinar to check out is AWS Activate. Uh, this is a, a service whereby people can dip their toe into the cloud, if I can mix my metaphors. Uh, they can try out cloud. They can uh, do it at very low or no cost and just kind of figure it out. And that is designed not for large established enterprises. It's designed for startups and medium enterprises and you know academic institutions who want to experiment with cloud. Uh, and so there, there are plenty of examples of this. But see, I, I think it's philosophical at its core, and that is we want to allow other entities, other organizations, startups, SMEs, um, even large enterprises, to allow them to focus on what differentiates their product or service. Because if, if, their, if their product or service is not differentiated by packing boxes and shipping things out, then we can do that for them. And they can focus on what they're really good at. And that's just so much more efficient. I mean, that's, that's kind of how you know, the infrastructure is developed within Amazon. We don't want to keep repeating things. Uh, part of the birth of AWS, I mean, there were, there, there were multiple uh, reasons why it came to be, but part of the reason why was we would have uh, product teams throughout the company developing new product lines, um, and they would have an expert in that product line or a team of experts uh, working to make that into a, a, a good business. Um, but they'd also have a, you know, a couple of software development engineers and database managers and you know, a couple of other. Every single one of these teams had these separate technical support people. And we're like, well, that, that seems so wasteful. And so part of what we were trying to do was provide a, a, a toolkit, a set of services available to everybody within the company so that the people who aren't you know, focused on developing software tools uh, could focus on what they're expert at. And the same applies to external parties. Let, let them you know, focus heads down on running their business, uh, selling their widgets or making their widgets for sale, uh, and not having to go out and buy computer hardware, for example, or lease software or pay developers. I mean, that was a huge barrier to entry to the internet uh, 20 years ago. 20 years ago, if you wanted an internet business, the first thing you had to do was get a bunch of cash and buy a bunch of compute hardware, lease a bunch of software, and then figure out how to run it. And you haven't even started your business yet. You're still just doing that. Uh, now you don't have to do that. Now it's a pay-as-you-go model. And, um, and it's not just us, of course. There are other cloud services providers, but, but we've always viewed it as a way to uh, allow creative individuals to be creative and do what they do best without having to worry about this kind of infrastructure stuff. Okay. Uh, how do you present uh, the direction for working uh, on innovations? How uh, go... Uh, 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 how, how do you give feedback uh, to people uh, who created uh, new solutions? Yeah, so uh, it's, feedback is important. Um, and uh, it, at the same time, I think the, the expectations are so high that, uh, that you have both the, you know, sort of the, the push to get to, to be innovative, to be inventive, uh, but there's also the freedom that sort of opens up that ability. And it really, I don't know, it just it is very liberating to have a CEO who says, you know, Please innovate. I understand you're going to fail a lot and you're going to lose a lot of money for the company. That's okay. 
I mean, that is incredibly liberating. I, I can't imagine sort of the, the reverse kind of thing and to have sort of a mid-level employee somewhere in the company and the, the boss, the big boss has never said anything about this and the, the mid-level employee wants to innovate something and tries it and it fails and it costs, you know, $200,000. Um, they're terrified for, you know, they might lose their job because they tried to innovate and they lost some money. Uh, we don't live in that kind of fear at Amazon. We, we know that the leadership of the company has, uh, has this long-term vision uh, that says, you know, don't worry about the short-term failures as long as we're learning and trying new things. So I, I, it feels like that's the kind of feedback um, is, is almost built into the system where we can say, hey, I'm sorry that didn't work out. I was rooting for you. But at the same time, that was great that you tried. And so even with a failure, you can end up having positive feedback. Okay, my question. Uh, uh, you say a lot uh, about uh, failure uh, tolerance in uh, Amazon. And are any uh, limitations, any borders of this uh, tolerance? It means, uh, are any failures you uh, couldn't uh, make in, in uh, you shouldn't uh, make in, in uh, Amazon? Yeah, um, sure, absolutely. They're guardrails. Um, I think the, the, the most obvious way one could fail and be held accountable for it is to do something that was not in the best interest of customers. If we were ever trying to invent something or try something new that didn't have a clear benefit to customers if it works, uh, then that is, that's a waste of time and it's actually working against customers. So we would never want that and you know, that, that is not rewarded for certain. Um, other kinds of failures that are, are uh, not, uh, uh, not tolerated are, are sort of deadline failures or organizational failures, uh, failure to uh, you know, follow through on commitments, those kinds of things. Those, those, are, those aren't experiments that didn't work out. Those are just you know, laziness or uh, bad work habits or bad ethics. I mean, all those things, none of those are tolerated. So the, the failure that I'm talking about is, a, is trying something new and it doesn't work. Um, that's what is you know, uh, expected and tolerated. Um, it's, it's not those other kinds of human you know, failures. We, we're hardworking people. We want to be smart. We want to be uh, kind to each other. I mean, you know, another kind of failure is to be mean to your fellow employees. Those, those people don't last long at Amazon. If, even if they get through the door, uh, then they don't stay long. Uh, just because that kind of a, uh, a hard work environment simply is not tolerated. When I say hard work, I mean you know, antagonistic work environment is not tolerated. Also, laziness is not tolerated either. I mean, we, we are, we are hardworking people because we have a mission. We, we really, really want to serve customers and do a better job at it. We see this huge opportunity to do it. Um, so those kinds of failures are not tolerated. Thank you. Uh, a little bit provocative uh, question. Uh, will companies like Amazon, along with Google, Microsoft, Facebook, etc., govern the world uh, as a site or direct uh, uh, effect of the global crisis, uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, crisis. Uh, it's uh, not uh, in terms of good or bad, but just a statement and prediction. Will Amazon will profit from the pandemia in the end of uh, the day uh, because of this uh, situation? Well, yeah, it's that's kind of a frustrating question to get, as, as you can imagine, uh, largely because that means we're damned if we do, damned if we don't, right? It, it, what we believe is that we should be doing the right thing by our employees, our customers, and society generally. And if that means taking short-term losses, and you know we are taking some very big short-term losses, as Jeff described in the, the annual report a few weeks ago, um, then uh, so be it. We have to do this. It's our responsibility. Uh, and I think our, the, the quarterly profits, I want to say it was like $4 billion, are all being plowed right back into um, you know, making, making sure the system continues to work. Um, and if we come out at the end of that and we're in good shape, I, I, that's a good thing, I think. Uh, but moreover, I just I, I would encourage people to uh, scrutinize Amazon. We, we are worthy of scrutiny. We're big enough. We're global enough to deserve scrutiny. That's great. Uh, but be fair about it. I mean, really get the facts uh, and don't let, you know, accusations that don't hold up uh, stand as fact because we, we face that too. So. Uh, the, as long as the scrutiny is you know, genuine and fact-based, we welcome it. Uh, it makes us better. Uh, we, we really want to be in a position where uh, we, we see uh, a problem and we have to 
sort of look in the mirror and we've been told about this thing. We look in the mirror and say, is that really true? And if so, do we need to fix it? And what do we need to do? Those sorts of things. But if at the end of it, we say, no, 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 that's, that's not really what happens or you know, this is not what it's made out to be, uh, then we have to go forward and continue to serve customers heads down. The other aspect of this, I think it's important to remember again, is that we're still talking about, you know, for, for e-commerce, like you know, 10 or 15 percent of the, the, the global uh, retail market. I mean, that's, that's on the high end of things. And so um, there is so much headroom here and opportunity to succeed that a lot of players, uh, you know, ones we haven't even heard of undoubtedly are going to be entering into this, um, uh, this field in, in the coming years. And, uh, you know, as I say, it's a good time to be a consumer because we're all competing like crazy and there's just a ton of opportunity. And then, then this coronavirus thing, um, we really want to, you know, first of all, take care of our employees and customers and then figure out new ways to do things that are you know, better, for, not only for employees and customers, but for society broadly. Okay, thank you. Uh, are innovative solutions developed uh, as per country culture or habits uh, um, or, or, uh, or the Amazon, general uh, Amazon? Uh, it's, it's a little bit uh, more um, complicated uh, because uh, I, I would like to ask additionally about um, this difference between culture, for example, of American Amazon, Polish Amazon, uh, Amazon in India, in, in China. Do you see any differences in this uh, uh, culture? Well, of course, uh, there, there are cultural differences in uh, some things that we have to be very sensitive to. In fact, um, because the roots of the company are uh, in the sale of cultural products. You gotta remember the very first things we sold were books. Uh, and that's, that's about as culture centric as you can get. And then we moved on to music and videos. And so these, these, these sorts of cultural products have always been ones we've uh, wanted to make sure that our customers in different locations were getting the, the, the right products. Um, there, there was a fear at one point, and maybe it was not a genuine fear, maybe it was just Trump, you know, it was just a, invented, uh, or maybe uh, it was a genuine fear, but misplaced that somehow Amazon was going to force American cultural products onto customers around the world. And so suddenly our customers in some country would be forced to be buying American uh, books and American movies only. Uh, and that's just a misunderstanding of how we do business. We're, we're going to serve our customers. We're going to meet their uh, demands and their wants uh, because we're obsessing over them. Not, we're not trying to force things onto them. And so those kinds of cultural differences, like for content, need to be respected. And there, it is different in different countries around the world. But for the most part, you know, consumers, no matter where they are in the world, they, they want more convenience. They want uh, more selection. They want lower prices and so forth. And, and if we're able to deliver those no matter where we are in the world, customers are going to be happy. Okay. Uh, a little bit private question. I can say something like that. Uh, what uh, would you do if you were to leave Amazon? Oh, yeah. It's, uh, I, well, I am in my uh, library here, and uh, it's my favorite room in the whole world, and uh, I love to read. So I think I would uh, have more time to read. That's one thing. I think, I'd, I think I'd like to teach. I'm, I'm very jealous of you, Professor. I mean, uh, that you've got a, a fabulous gig. And uh, if, if I were to become your colleague someday, that would be, that would be delightful. Okay. Uh, maybe, if, uh, what's, uh, maybe a few more questions. Uh, uh, maybe a question about uh, some uh, influences of, of uh, different uh, culture systems for, for, for um, uh, Amazon. There's a question about uh, uh, lean management, uh, about uh, Toyota philosophy. Uh, do you uh, use any elements of this philosophy in uh, Amazon? Yeah, it's, it, it's a, a reasonable question. Um, I, don't, I don't think we explicitly do uh, all the time. Uh, the one exception is pretty obvious is Kaizen, as I already told you, we practice those. Um, but we've developed our own culture over the years to a point where it's very stable. Uh, those leadership principles that I've talked about, and you can, as I say, you can check out on our websites, um, they've been around unchanged. I think the last change may have been uh, 2015, something like that. Um, and they're, they're very stable. Will they change in the future as 
uh, circumstances change externally, I'm, I'm sure we'll have some modifications here and there, but the core ones will remain the same. And so we have our own uh, set of uh, you know, principles around which we operate. And that includes the management techniques that we've already mentioned. Some are borrowed uh, in the spirit of uh, Kaizen, um, and some are you know, self homegrown, and we've evolved over time. And, and you know, Jeff has been um, our leader from the very beginning. And so the, the reality is that many of these ideas were germinated with him first. And so the fact that he still is the CEO, as well as the founder, uh, it helps maintain this culture over all these years. But I think he has enough inertia now, uh, and we believe in the, uh, these leadership principles enough, that they, they will last for a long time. I'm, I'm very confident. Uh, let's go back to trends. What are three the most important trends now to follow for Amazon? Uh, trends. Well, I, I guess the one that's top of mind is, you know, distance communication, distance shopping, uh, distance work. Uh, it, you know, these, this just came upon us in a way that, uh, as I say, I don't think anyone expected. I, you know, so you, you would find uh, other you know, uh, speakers to be more qualified to, to look at trends more generally. But I really feel like um, the, uh, where the company is going, I think is predictable in two ways. Um, the question I usually get, Professor, is you know, where, what's Amazon gonna be doing in 10 or 15 or 20 years? And uh, as for specifics, I really don't know. I mean, if, if I had been asked to guess 20 years ago when I was you know, in my first year at the company, would I have guessed you know, cloud computing, logistics, studios, uh, you know, no. Uh, you know, we got 60 wide body aircraft that we leased. It, no, I mean, those sorts of things were just not predictable as specific things. But I am very confident that 10, 15, 20 years from now, Amazon will be a customer obsessed company. And many of the, the new products and services that it offers are going to be ones that we developed as an expertise with an, uh, a current business and then made it available to others. Um, and I think those two patterns are so fundamental to Amazon that they will remain with us forever. Um, and that, that customer obsession principle, if that ever gets diluted or goes away, then in, in practical terms, that's not Amazon anymore. Okay. Uh, maybe the last question, uh, because it's uh, 9 uh, p.m. in Warsaw already, so, so we should uh, finish. But if, you, uh, if we can ask the last question, it, uh, it would be perfect. Uh, is it okay? Yeah, of course. I'm, uh, yeah. Okay. How to stay innovative as an individual? Uh, what helps you as a person to stay innovative? I know that you are the author of three patents uh, at uh, uh, Amazon, so uh, you are the um, part of this innovative machine uh, of, of uh, Amazon too. Yeah, as, as a personal matter, I think it's very important to have a purpose. Um, and the company's purpose of obsessing over customers is it guides us. Uh, if, if somehow that went away, we'd be lost. I'm not sure we would know what to do. So likewise, as an individual, knowing what I want to accomplish for the company is super important. I actually practice some of these business techniques uh, in, in my personal life, as well as in, uh, uh, you know, sort of a, a, a private part of my business life, which is to say I have in my figurative uh, desk drawer five press releases right now. And uh, these are ones announcing products or services that maybe were external, maybe are internal, but the, the point is they are goals that I have set out for myself in the form of writing a press release. Now, will any of these actually go out on the PR wire as a press release? Uh, maybe one, a long shot would be two. The, the other three, there's just no way. They're not really meant for that, but they're a way of explaining uh, what I'm working on day to day, even if it's fairly mundane. But here's, here's what I imagine. I imagine a circumstance where I'm sitting in my desk in my office and there's a knock at the door. And I say, come in. Um, she wa a woman walks in and she says, hey, I'm a customer uh, of Amazon's. What are you working on? And if I say, well, um, I just finished up uh, some email. I'm working on a, I'm writing a report. I have a conference call in about 15 minutes here. And uh, uh, tonight I'll do some more email when I get home. And she'll look at me and say, wait a minute, I'm your customer. What, what, what's all this? This doesn't matter to me. I don't care about any of this. Then what I do, figuratively again, I reach into my desk drawer and I pull out these five press releases and I show her and she reads them and she says, oh, so all those emails and conference calls are to do this? 
And I said, yeah, that's why I'm doing all these emails and conference calls is to do these things. She's like, oh, okay, that's great. That, that makes me very happy as a customer. Keep going, keep, hey, go do it. She, she leaves. So the point is, if I could not explain to her what the conference calls, the emails, the meetings, the reports were about, if I cannot explain to her what's in it for her, I've got to really question why I'm doing any of this, right? It's that important that you focus on the customer. How would you explain to a customer what you're doing day to day? And that gets you through all these emails. It gives you a purpose. It gives you a, a, a goal for yourself as well, as well as for the company. Thank you very much. Uh, it was a great uh, presentation, especially for me. I, I have to say that uh, Amazon is one of my favorite uh, case studies. I teach uh, my students. Uh, oh, I teach my students uh, using Amazon uh, to uh, how important is the organizational culture in the organization, especially from the point of leader, how to intentionally create such an organizational culture uh, in organization. And uh, Jeff Bezos and Amazon, as I said, it's, uh, I started to, interest, uh, to be interested in this company 20 years uh, ago in the beginning of, of 2000s. So I, I observe a company more or less as long as you work for, for uh, 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 Amazon. Uh, and uh, really, it was great pleasure for me to uh, really uh, to have this possibility to understand the culture of Amazon from the point of view of such an important uh, person as you are uh, at uh, Amazon. So thank you very much for, for this uh, presentation. Uh, but I think, I think I should uh, uh, ask you now to... to uh, Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Paul. It was a great, uh, not presentation, it was a great speech. Thank you very much. Uh, we love Amazon too, and we are uh, treating you in the space business too, because we love me and Pavel love space business also. So we know your uh, chief uh, has very big plans in uh, space activity. So thank you very much. Uh, it was really great to uh, have you here. Uh, so cheering uh, from Warsaw. Uh, we are waiting for uh, seeing you in life, uh, maybe we can meet uh, after after COVID in Poland or in the US. So I, I would like that very much, and I, you know, we we can do our, our elbow bumps, right? Yeah, <laughs> of course. Yeah, but we don't have now masks, so <laughs> it's unusual now. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks a lot, uh, Paul. It was a great pleasure. Um, unfortunately, we couldn't uh, ask you all questions because, as you can see, uh, there, there was more than 15, 50 uh, questions. So we will need uh, about half a day to, <laughs> to uh, answer uh, every question. But thank you very much. And I would like to thank uh, uh, Rafał. Rafał, uh, you can see that we uh, we've met in a hairdresser because we have the same hairdresser in Warsaw. Uh, so we met. We've met there. Similar to but, Jeff Bezos. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Jeff, of course. Uh, but uh, uh, to be honest, Rafał is uh, uh, the founder of the best Polish uh, MBA studies. So if anybody from attendees uh, wants, uh, wants to have uh, MBA, we, uh, we can say that Rafał uh, has best uh, MBA studies. Thank you, Rafał, for the rating. Thank you very much. And uh, Claudia, could you show us the recording? Uh, yes, uh, just give me one second so I can, do you hear me? Yeah, you hear me. Uh, so, yeah, I can... so, so, so Claudia and I have the same hairdresser. <laughs> yeah, more or less. Definitely, I'm not using, I'm not going to the hairdresser that these guys are going. <laughs> but funny, you mentioned it. Uh, I, I called my hairdresser um, like yesterday and... Um, 
and I have an appointment like in two weeks because the hairdressers yeah. were relieved in Poland, you know, so awesome. all the women went crazy. And But anyways, <laughs> this is the graphic recording I did. I was trying to catch, um, you know, the essence that, uh, of, of, of your speech. Um, it was very interesting listening to you and uh, um, because I'm hungry, this part was the, the toughest one. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and I'm really, I feel uh, really inspired by your idea of having um, like five press releases next to your desk or, you know, in, in, in um, close to you so you don't lose track and you don't lose your main focus. So thank you very much for that. That was, that was really inspiring. Awesome. I love this. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will send you it uh, by email. Please uh, do. You can use it. Thank you very much. And Pavel, uh, could you say uh, who will be next? You, you have to unmute. Unmute. Okay, I'll do it. Pavel, you have to unmute. Po raz pierwszy w naszym cyklu We Innovators Club mamy spotkanie z kobietą, a w zasadzie z dwoma na raz, bo e, zarówno gospodarzem, jak i gościem e, są e, wspaniałe, innowacyjne panie. E, gospodarzem e, będzie Eliza Kulczkowska, gościem e, Sramana Mitra, która jest e, w Polsce może jeszcze niezbyt znana, natomiast w Stanach jest prawdziwym guru, jeśli chodzi o inwestowanie w startupy więc przybliży nam, co to jest bootstrapping. Ja też na początku nie wiedziałem, ale mam nadzieję, że po tym webinarze będziecie wszystko wiedzieć o bootstrappingu. Ja wiedziałem. No tak, dlatego, dlatego, ty, jesteś, dlatego ty jesteś moim szefem, no słuchaj. No. I myślę, że to będzie też mieć bardzo ciekawy, pouczający wieczór. Zapraszamy na sobotę. Tak, zapraszamy, zapraszamy na sobotę. Fantastyczny, szykuje się kolejny fantastyczny webinar. To, co jeszcze chciałem tylko dodać, że bardzo nam zależy na tym, żeby diversity zaistniało w naszych webinarach, więc walczymy o to, żeby zapraszać więcej kobiet jeszcze. So, last, last words. Paul, thank you very much. Claudia, thank you. thank you. Rafał, thank you. And Paweł, thank you see you much. tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you. Paweł, see you tomorrow. <laughs> see you, see you. Bye. Dziękujemy Państwu wszystkim za to, że spędziliście z nami wieczór.